Hi, everybody. This is Matthew Pose of Pose Acoustics. I'm answering questions again. And Howard, um, is it Skeevies, 4184, had written something. He had given some money, and, and I uh, appreciate that again. Um, obviously, when you guys pay, it gives me an impetus to want to answer your questions because I think that's being responsive, and you've essentially paid for my time. So um, the question is a good one. In fact, I had to go back to AJ to be like, what the heck did you say that I agreed to? So it says, Matthew, I recently watched a video where you were conversing with AJ from Soundfield Audio. AJ stated uh, words to the effect of, I firmly believe that the loudspeakers should load the room correctly, negating the need to use EQ to compensate for the speaker's inadequacies. You appeared to agree with AJ, least ways you made no attempt at countermanding AJ's statement. Yet in most of the videos I've watched where you're discussing a speaker's performance, you seem to strongly advocate EQ. Does this mean that in your opinion, most speakers are inadequate? So I actually wrote AJ, I probably should have gone back to watch the video too, but I wrote AJ and said, "What do you remember what you were talking about? And he said, well, that's not what I said. I was, of course, referring to having smooth off-axis above transition and gradient base below. Didn't say EQ, which is necessary below transition. Tell him to watch the video again. Oh, realized where that was from and commented. Whoa, I'll re rewatch that when I get home, but a quick view has me explaining my view on stereo room treatment at around 450. So, I won't get back into all that. You guys can go back to that. I will go into what I think. Um, first off, AJ is basically saying he does not agree that EQ is not needed. He thinks EQ is needed, as do I. <clears throat> so let's talk about what I think in regard to this. I'm not going to speak for AJ other than, like I said, he did come back and say, no, no, he thinks EQ is needed at least below the room transition. There's modes in rooms, and even if you find ways to smooth those out using the multi-sub approach, even if you minimize some of the room interactions using cardioid bass, something AJ likes, there's always going to be modes. Those methods he uses do not mitigate or eliminate modes. And while there has been some arguments by some people that you should leave modes alone, um, I think that's actually mostly been argued in very large rooms. So for a long time, there had been an argument in commercial cinemas and in dubbing stages not to EQ the bass to get rid of the effects of modes because those rooms were so large that the modes were actually very much on top of each other. And it wasn't those, the, the um, more sparse, discrete modes you see in small rooms. You all are listening in a small room, so that doesn't apply to you. And actually that argument ultimately wasn't agreed with and wasn't adopted into Simpty. It was just one of the experts at the time believed that they're not particularly audible. The very strong modes that we have in small rooms are in fact very audible. And so EQing the effect of arrows out over the listening area, again, even if you make it more consistent, is a good idea. AG agrees with that. That's a lot of what I believe. Creating the right overall spectral balance for the system AJ's focus more on stereo systems where you've got two speakers that have been properly balanced on their own. And so in many cases, uh, outside of the bass region, a lot of EQ isn't necessarily needed and there wouldn't necessarily be a huge need to compensate um, for errors in that speaker because he's already done a good job. <coughs> in my case, most of what I'm dealing with are separate subwoofers and main speakers where there's a need to make sure that the system is aligned well together and the response is nice and smooth and clean through that integration. And so EQ can play a role in that. Um, I, I say EQ, but really what I'm referring to is DSB manipulation. And it could, so it may not just be EQ, it could be all pass filters, shell filters, or PEQ. Um, now, there are also other exceptions though. So Sometimes a perfectly good speaker in a particular room with a particular acoustic issue has a sound at certain frequencies that just doesn't seem right. And Adam Pels and I have talked about this recently. Like sometimes things will measure really well in a room. They're like nice and smooth and flat. And you look at it and you're like, yeah, it looks good. And then you listen to it and you're like, but man, that is irritating. And you'll put stuff that you're familiar with and you can hear a coloration in it. And it's, I'm going to explain how we fix it, but then I'll explain where it comes from. And again, AJ doesn't disagree with this view. So the speaker may overall look pretty good. And it, you know, sometimes it can be hard to nitpick um, what's happening in, these, in the spinorama data, but often the information is there that explains these issues. So we'll hear this coloration, even though we don't see it in the steady state response. And so you'll knock it out. 
um, what you'll do is you'll find the ranger that's happening and you'll put a little dip in there that helps to compensate for that. And it's because there's an excess of energy in the room. It's just not showing up in the steady state because it's hanging on over time, but not in the period that um, it, where the sound accumulated in the steady state measurement. That's usually caused from a directivity issue. So it's usually something happening in the off-axis response that's different from the on-axis response. And it's dominating our perceptions while it's not dominating the steady state. This is actually, as an example, the BBC dip is, is what that is. Now, many people say, oh, no, the BBC dip was garbage. Well, it's not garbage. And actually, there was a lot of research that went into doing that. The issue with it was that blanket applying a dip like that to a speaker, you're compensating for a flaw in the speaker. So first off, the better thing to do would be to fix the speaker in the first place. And there are speakers that don't suffer from that problem either as much or at all. But what I found over the years is that there's no free lunch, basically. You can create speakers that don't have those issues, but often they have other issues. Or you can create speakers that don't have those other issues, but then they, they do end up having some issues with these directivities. So I, I talk about Perlisten a lot. The directivity index on that is really good, but it's not absolutely perfect. And no speaker is perfect, but there's a couple little issues in there, and they are related to some ever so slight directivity issues that are happening. In, in the case of the Perlisten, it's actually more in the vertical than the horizontal which is why they ultimately decided to leave it alone because the cost and the fix would have been ridiculous uh, in a speaker like that. Um, I don't find the issue in the Perlisons needs to be EQ'd out. I find it okay as is, but I, there, who knows? Maybe certain rooms it could be a problem. There are other speakers where that issue actually shows up more in the horizontal and there's just like a slight mismatch and you'll kind of see like a slight, slight shift basically in the directivity index because of it. And unless you're absorbing the sidewalls, which AJ doesn't agree with and I don't agree with, um, those reflections off the sidewalls then are going to contribute to what you hear in such a way that that can become irritating. And you can end up EQing a nice smooth flat response and you're still getting irritation from this excess of energy. And so you compensate by putting that dip in at the point of the crossover where the mismatch is happening. Or it's usually actually just above the crossover. So... Um, there are issues like that that come up. There are other issues, too, where, like, speaker seems to measure nice and smooth and flat in the room, but it just doesn't sound maybe as bright as you want. Maybe it's not the speaker. Maybe it's the recording, right? We've talked about that before. Recordings are kind of all over the place, and so sometimes you have to compensate for that. So maybe you'll put in a shell filter for that song. Ooh, and remember. So the other thing, of course, is your hearing. Some people's hearing varies. I know a lot of people who actually really like very bright speakers, and they'll tell you that actual smooth neutral speakers to them sound dull and they don't like them. And then they check their hearing and their hearing has a lot of high frequency loss. So what they're doing is they're enjoying speakers that are naturally compensating for their hearing loss. <coughs> Excuse me, I apologize, getting sick. So um, I think that that's actually it, another thing that's totally reasonable. If you've got hearing loss, compensating for your high frequency loss. And I'll just say, if you're over 40 and you're a man, you probably have some high frequency hearing loss. That's pretty common. Um, so compensating for that makes sense. And EQ is a mechanism by which you can compensate for that hearing loss. And, and it's important to also know that hearing loss is not always linear. It's not like you just have like a shelf down of your highs. Often it's specific frequency bands that are, that are way off. And so again, boosting those particular bands may help restore our perception of neutrality. So the answer to your question is um, maybe AJ overstated exactly what he was trying to get at. It, he, he does actually believe EQ is a good idea. He's not against using it. Um, and I may have confused folks because I've probably never really gone into great detail about how I EQ systems in suggesting that like, so what, I don't EQ to a curve. I'm not particularly interested in seeing a system that measures dead flat in the room. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a system that generally tracks a uh, neutral looking target, which the speaker itself needs to do in the first place. So I shouldn't need a lot of EQ to get there. And then I'm using EQ to fix base problems, transition zone problems. And then uh, the other thing I often use it for just as part of calibration is restoring high frequency loss that's happening for other reasons. So as an example, in any of the home theater builds I do where I'm putting speakers behind the acoustically transparent screen, I've got the problem of needing to be able to compensate 
uh, for the high frequency loss the screen introduces. Even if it's only one dB, that's going to be audible. And what I find is that, and again, it's not linear. It's not like it's one dB across the board. What I often find is it's, and it depends on how far the screen is from the speakers. Keep that in mind. Um, it might be like one dB at five kilohertz, but then it might be two dB at 10 kilohertz, and it might be four or five dB at 20 kilohertz. And if the speaker can't handle it, I'm not going to fix all of that. But if the speaker can, I might restore all the high frequencies. Um, so EQ becomes an important part of making sure that a system sounds correct. The other thing is that in a surround system, we've got a problem, which is that we very rarely have the opportunity to use identical speakers across all the channels. So many of you actually don't have identical speakers across most of the channels. Um, most people are doing home theaters in their living room and they have a TV and they're not able to have a left center and right speaker that are identical vertically oriented speakers. So often what you have are a left and a right speaker that are vertically oriented and you have a horizontally oriented speaker uh, under your TV, right? Or like in my case, in this room I'm in, I have one over the TV. So then you've got this issue, which is that the uh, dispersion of those speakers don't match. And it doesn't, some of you will say, oh, hold on, I got the matching one. It's got the mid range below the tweeter. It's the same. It's not. Unless it's identically arranged and it is the identical speaker, it's not the same speaker. And the dispersion is different and the response is different. And we've never measured, uh, for what it's worth, a horizontally arranged center channel of any kind that perfectly matched the vertically arranged left-right speakers within the same line from any manufacturer at Audioholics or anywhere I've ever done this before. They always differ at least a little bit. And it doesn't take a lot of difference to sound different. So that's just, and that's like the most minor of them because often then the left and the right surrounds, the rear surrounds, and worse yet, the tops are all so dramatically different from your front stage that their directivity is a lot different and their response is a lot different and it creates issues. So what, what we end up doing is we compensate by taking measurements of the left, the center, the right, the left surround, the right surround, the left rear surround, the right rear surround, we overlay them and we look at where they're similar, where they're different. And you don't want to like, again, fine tune it too much. You end up overcompensating for stuff that's not particularly audible, but you do want to look for especially broad variations between them that are going to create a difference in the timbre. And then you correct for that with EQ. So what you typically do is you leave the left and the right alone. We're going to call that our reference. It is what it is. The center, we're going to want to match the left and the right subjectively as much as possible. So the measurements help us get there, but you do got to listen. So you'll play some pink noise, you'll play some music tracks you're familiar with, you'll move it around the speakers, and you'll make some little adjustments until they line up subjectively, and then the measurements should, of course, look more similar too. Then you're going to do the same thing with the surrounds, and you make some adjustments until it just seems like they all sound the same. You do have to do this with your ears. Anybody who's ever taken the HAA course will know that a big part of that course is learning how to listen with your ears and understand these differences because all the experts I know, my own experience, all say the same thing. You cannot EQ based on measurements alone. You will not get good results because, and it's not a subjective, we're not talking about some of the stuff like, um, because I said so. This is, there are scientific reasons for why this is true. Steady state, the very first article, remember this, that I ever wrote for Audioholics, talked about the difference between the way microphones hear things and your ears hear things. And it's a good, I think, it's a pretty good read. Take a, take a look at it. But you have to use your ears because we just don't have a way right now to measure in a room and get measurements on a computer that are a perfect translation to what you're hearing that would allow us to do this. So you got to do both. And you need to trust your ears over the measurements with a good understanding of the science because there's not an easy way to translate those directivity issues into corrections in the measurements. So I hope that's helpful. I support EQ, AJ support EQ. Um, and uh, keep watching, we've got more videos coming. So thanks. <laughs>